I'm Shanna Daly. I have a degree in engineering education, and I've been working um, in the area of design research for quite a while now. And this is one of the projects that I'm lucky to be involved in, working with Colleen and Seda Ilmez and Rich Gonzalez, who aren't here, but definitely important contributing members. And then we also have James Christian here, who just graduated um, from Michigan this May um, with a double degree, double major in mechanical engineering and art design. And I'm going to let him say a few things um, in a second. Today we're talking about the specific tool for concept generation. I know you're all studying creativity, and so we're going to go through um, how this specific um, idea generation tool works. Um, I'll give you some background, and we'll talk about how, to, how, to, how it works, and then we'll have you do it yourselves. But Jim has worked with the cards in his field, and so I'm going to let him just say a couple of things up front to kind of tell you give you an idea of what the experience is like for someone else. Especially in senior design and mechanical engineering this year, we use these cards. Um, I know this is abstract right now because you guys haven't seen the cards yet, but, um, but the, the strategies and the things you can learn from the cards are really useful, and they were really useful in our team when we were designing, and, uh, and our, our final outcome, which was relatively successful, uh, has a lot of evidence of the things that we got to from the cards. Um, so I, I think that if you, uh, if you go into to a project like this or, or using a strategy like this with an open mind and, and really try and dig into the cards and, and think about all the possibilities that could come out of each of them, um, you'll find some really valuable stuff. So um, I know all of you might not consider yourselves designers. Um, that's how I'll talk about it today as a designer. But I will tell you, you all are designers. Anytime you're faced with an open-ended problem that has multiple options and areas for development, when you work toward that solution, you are designing a solution. So when I use that language of you as designers, please consider yourself uh, yourselves designers, because you are. So, which sets me up for my first slide, which is at some point when you're designing, you've discovered a design problem or someone has given you a design problem and you're faced with, with this thing called design space exploration. What that means is given a problem, there's this, this thing that you could call the solution space. And in the solution space are all of the possible solutions to your particular design problem. And so your job um, at that point is to come up with a variety of possible solutions, to develop a number of solutions in the design solution space. Um, in an ideal world, you would have a lot of solutions. The solutions would be diverse from one another. They would be creative. And then as you went along through the rest of your design work, you would synthesize those ideas, pick the best features of particular ideas, um, get rid of the things that didn't work. And then at the end, you'd have this really great, innovative, creative outcome. That's not what happens, however, in a lot of design work. Um, especially novice designers really struggle with, diff with generating a variety of ideas. So um, oftentimes, even if they think that they've created a variety of ideas, it's really the same idea, but just tweaked a little bit. Another really big problem um, in exploring that solution space is this thing called fixation. Have you guys talked about fixation yet in here? No, no, okay, Colleen's saying no. Okay, so fixation sort of means you're attached to this particular concept. And, it, and fixation comes in a variety of forms. Some people are fixated on existing products. So if I were to ask you to design a pen, in the back of your mind, you'd be thinking of what pens look like now, and the solutions that you would come up with would look a lot like what a pen already looks like. That's a type of fixation. If you've had a similar design experience to what you're, what you're currently designing, you're going to be fixated on sort of replicating what those past experiences have looked like. The third type of fixation, which I see a lot, is this strong attachment to a first idea. In a lot of classes that I work in, I see students who think that this first idea is like the golden ticket to success, and they don't want to let it go. There's a lot of design research that says the first idea is not the best idea, and that really great idea doesn't come until idea 55 or 82. It's when you push further than those initial ideas that you get to the good stuff. So the tool that we're going to talk about today, the 77 cards, uh, the design heuristics, are one approach to combating some of these struggles that, that people face in design. So this is, this is the outcome. So when you, when you get stuck with fixation, when you struggle to generate multiple ideas, you have this narrow design space, and your outcome isn't very creative. 
The research team that I've been working with um, has been investigating this question. What can we do to promote creativity and diversity that can lead to innovation? Success in concept generation leads to um, innovations in your end outcomes. So one of the ways uh, to promote creativity and diversity during concept generation is to use concept generation techniques. And that's what the design heuristic cards are. They're a concept generation technique that support you in exploring the design space. The other thing that's really important to point out is that one of the things that stall us from getting that creative idea is that we evaluate ourselves, sometimes before we put our pen to the paper, but even as we're drawing, we kick out ideas because we think, oh, that's not going to work, that'll never work, that's a bad idea. But today, and any time you're in this sort of idea generation phase, you really need to put yourself in the headspace that it's not about evaluation at this stage. Anything goes, it's about getting that pool of ideas on your paper. So what, what am I talking about when I say heuristics? So the term cognitive heuristics comes from psychology, and it means some type of reasoning process, some type of shortcut that gets you to a solution. It's not necessarily the best solution, but it gets you to a solution to consider. And so we analogize that to design heuristics, and so design heuristics are prompts that get you quickly to some design solutions. And so you can imagine if you use a variety of design heuristics, then you would have a variety of solutions uh, to, take, to take along the way in the rest of your design process. The design heuristics are represented on these cards, and this is what we're gonna work with today is this deck of cards. Here we're just representing a few of them. Each card has a particular strategy on it, and the strategies come from a few different places. One of those, Places is a study that we did with a professional designer. So he was designing uh, bathroom fixtures and features for accessibility, and we studied what were the tools and techniques that he used to have a broad solution space as he was generating ideas. The next study was a study of award-winning products. So what were the particular characteristics about certain products that made them innovative? What made them different from the products that existed before? And then the final study was a really large study where we looked at experts, we looked at advanced students in design, and we asked them to think aloud as we gave them a design task. So we gave them a design task, we said, we want you to generate as many different creative ideas as you can, and we want you to talk aloud while you're doing it. And we recorded what they said as they talked aloud, and we recorded what they drew as they talked aloud. And from the combination of all of these studies, we extracted these 77 strategies, uh, these heuristics that we're going to work with today. So this is you. You know, if you can imagine yourself at the beginning of a, of a design task, you have these initial ideas that are sort of floating around in your mind. What we already talked about is that these initial ideas are probably not the best ideas. We call them the obvious ideas. So if we gave somebody else the same design task that you were working on, these would probably be the ideas that first came to their mind. So we want to get away from this obvious idea space and more fully explore what options we have. And so that's what the design heuristics do. They help take us from this place of initial obvious ideas to other ideas that we wouldn't ne necessarily have found on our own. Okay, so what what the heck am I talking about when I'm talking about design heuristics? So this is an example of one card. So at the top of every card is the title, so that's the particular strategy. This one is apply existing mechanism in a new way. In the middle of every card is some kind of abstract image that's representative of what the strategy is. And then at the bottom is a more fully written description. And I'll read this out loud um, to you. Consider whether existing products or their components can fulfill the desired function. This can facilitate reuse of existing products, make the design process more efficient, and expand the pool of options. So this is the front of the card. The back of the card provides two examples of what it means to, to use that particular strategy on the top of the card. So what does it mean to apply an existing mechanism in a new way? This example on the left-hand side is a desk organizer that actually uses these paint bristles to help organize the different things that you would have on your desk. 
So the existing mechanism is the paintbrush bristles, and they're being used in a different way than what you would normally expect. The example on the right of every card is always some kind of seating device. In this particular case, the existing mechanism are these suction cups and pieces of glass. Usually, you would carry glass with suction cups, but now they're being mounted onto this frame to create a seat. So these are suction cups holding these pieces of glass to make a chair. So now that I'm ex I've explained it, this is where I start to put you to work to practice. So together, we're going to talk about um, how to utilize an opposite surface. So first, I'll just read the card prompt, and then I'll tell you what I want you to do. So to utilize an opposite surface means to create a distinction between the exterior and interior, front and back, or bottom and top. Make use of both surfaces for complementary or different functions. This can increase efficiency in the use of surfaces and materials or facilitate a new way to achieve a function. Okay, so basically, um, what I want you to do is think about a concept. So like take your everyday chair. We're going to play with chairs for a while. Think about your regular chair and think about how you could utilize an opposite surface of a chair to make it different. It can still be a chair, but maybe it's got an, another feature to it. Does anybody have any questions about what I want you to think about? Yeah. Can we also turn the part into a new product? Other yeah, for sure. Yeah. So what I'd like you to do is just take a couple minutes. You can talk to people around you. I want you to think about just a regular seating device, some kind of chair, how you can utilize an opposite surface of it to make it something new, different, better. So take a couple minutes, talk, think about it, and then we'll talk about it as a group. OK, so let's talk about a couple of ideas that you came up with. Is somebody willing to share the idea that you talked about? How could you utilize an opposite surface on a chair? What do you think? Yeah. Um, we said that you could use like the bottom seat for one of those like emergency seat cushions in an airplane or for sledding, and then you could use like the bottom frame for either a towel rack or art or decoration. Cool. So your first idea, you sort of took the chair apart and used the surface for something totally different. Yeah. And the other one, you added a towel rack to the bottom of the chair. Great. You have another idea? Oh, um, so something that we're talking about, like, if you put the chair down, you kind of use the other side of the bottom to, like, as a backrest and sit on the floor. OK. So it's a chair regular, but then you can, like, sit on the floor if you turn it around some way and it props your back up. Yeah. Good idea. What else? Yeah. Um, I had friends who in eighth grade actually flipped the chair over mm -hmm. and then sat on bottom back of it and use the back of it to propel themselves to jump and space jump and fight each other. Okay. So, <laughs> so now the up opposite surface is some kind of toy or, or yeah, they turn play or anything. Good, good. How about one more idea? One more idea. Yeah. Uh, we said that you could create like a surface on the back of it um, that, would, that would double it like an armrest. Cool. Sometimes armrests are really annoying. You could still focus on like what's going on. Oh, that's a great idea. Great, great. So an armrest on the back of the chair for when you're switching positions and has some storage. That's great. So this is the actual back of the Utilize Opposite Surface card. I'll start with the chair since that's what we just talked about. I think your ideas were a little bit more interesting than this one, but here for the opposite surface of this chair, there's a storage container on the back. This side bottom surface is also being used. And then they also use this place, you know, sort of in between these surfaces as an additional surface for storage. The example on the other side is a shoe where the laces actually wrap around the side and onto the bottom of the shoe for a better fit for your foot. So they're using that bottom surface of the shoe uh, to make an improvement to the functionality of it. So I think you're getting the hang of it, but let's do one more. So this card is convert for second function. Here's the abstract image you can see in this particular orientation. It has some kind of function, then you move it and it has the second function. The description is create multiple stable states of the product where each state defines a separate function. Transitions between these states can be achieved through rearranging, reorienting, and attaching or detaching components. This can allow multiple functions to be incorporated into one product. So let's stay with our chairs. So let's think about chairs. It doesn't have to be this chair. It could be any chair, any seating device you can imagine. But think about a way that you could convert a standard seating device to have a second function. And I'll give you a couple minutes again. Talk with your neighbor, see if you can come up with an idea or two about how you could convert for second function. 
Okay, so let's talk about what you came up with. You've got an idea. Great, so the chair converts to a table. Yeah. Great. Um, mine is a little weird, but if you make the back a little bit taller, you could have it be a bookshelf, and then there could be bands in the back to uh, hold the books in place so that uh, you can sit on it while you're reading, and then you can flip it over and put a cushion on it, and it could be like a twin side bed type deal. So it's a bookshelf and a bed, or were those two yeah. separate ideas? It's a bookshelf bed. Okay, it's a bookshelf, <laughs> a bed, a chair. Cool, great. Um, you could put like enclosing walls between the legs at the bottom, and then store stuff in it. Yeah, storage, so storage at the bottom of the chair. Other ideas? What else? You got one? Yeah, we were saying if they flipped it over, you'd be able to like, store books under it somehow. Mm -hmm. A shelf. Maybe. So flip it, the reorientation mm -hmm. of it makes it a shelf. Good idea. Anything else that you wanted to share? Okay, so let me show you the back of this card. So in this particular case, it's a reclining chair in this orientation, and then it can prop upright so that she has really great posture. You can see how happy, right, that she is about converting for second function. This is a good card. <laughs> um, and so the other example is a table. And so its first function is as a table. And then the second function is it's flipped up so that it acts as a room divider. And so you could imagine having these tables in a room where you might need to change the space. You flip it, you make it a divider, and now it's multiple spaces for meetings. Um, any questions? about the cards so far. One of the things that I want to point out is that from this, from this same card and from the same card that we used before, you guys had a lot of different ideas. And the reason I want to point that out is because it, me it means a couple things. It means there's no right answer, right? When you use a card, there's not one thing that you can come up with. And it also means that one card can help you come up with many ideas. And that's what we want to happen, right? We want a lot of ideas to get on your paper that are different from each other. And that can happen from one card. It can happen from multiple cards. It can happen with the combination of cards. So I want you to think about that as we move into the activity that we're going to start. So what we're going to do is we're going to give, uh, so we're going to divide you into teams first. And then we're going to give each of you individually a subset of these cards that you can work on with by yourself. One of the things that we found um, with teaching this is that it's really nice for people to have their individual time first where they can think of their own ideas, explore their own cards, and then after maybe 15 minutes, then we'll get you into a group. And within your team, you'll have the whole deck. And so then you can talk to each other, share, trade cards, uh, combine ideas, and move forward. But we'll start with where you're working individually. Um, Jim's going to come around and he's going to pass out the cards. He's also going to pass out some um, papers so that for every concept that you generate, it's got a space for you to draw that concept, and it's got a space for you to describe the concept. So that when you leave, say you were taking this design project you're doing today um, out, you know, out to, to, to be this big project, right? then you would leave today with a collection of the ideas that you made today that you could explore and refine later. So just take a couple minutes, see what's in your envelope, um, read what cards you have, and then I'll put up the task that we're going to be working on today. So first, just see what cards are on your envelope. Read them, look at the fronts, look at the backs, see what you think. OK, so let me just grab your attention for a minute. You can keep um, looking at the cards in a second, but I want to situate the context for you. So what we're going to do for the next 10, 15 minutes is your design task is to de design a novel salt and pepper shaker set. And so that's your design task. And so what I want you to do is I want you to really equally consider all of your cards and see what concept you can create from each of your cards. You can combine multiple cards together to create one concept. You can use one card to generate multiple concepts. One of the things that I don't want you to do, though, is look at a card and say, this doesn't apply, you know, and get rid of it. Because oftentimes, the very best ideas come from that card where you said it's never going to work. So equally consider all of your cards. Jim and I will be walking around. Feel free to grab us and say, you know, hey, what about this? Or if you have a question, feel free to ask. And then we'll come together and sort of talk about how that experience went. And then we'll move to the team part. Please draw all of your concepts on a concept sheet with your goal being in the next 15 minutes, you'll have five new concepts drawn and described on those concept sheets that we passed out. So five concepts about this? Correct. Okay. If you have more than five concepts, totally go for it. And I have plenty of concept sheets, but I think your, your minimum is five. Once you hit five, let us know and we'll pass out more sheets. Okay, so let's 
let's just talk for a minute. Obviously, that was an abbreviated idea generation session. In real life, you could have a couple hours. You could play through the whole deck, take your time, not feel rushed. But just in general, let's talk about what that was like. So any comments about the following things I'd like for us to talk about. So what did you think of the cards? What did you think about the process of generating ideas using the cards? How did using these maybe compare to other ways that you've generated ideas before? And then, you know, any other thing you notice? Yeah. At first I was a little overwhelmed, like after reading through all the cards. Um, but then once you gave us the task, um, I didn't really realize it until I would fill out the bottom box. And then I would see that I used like eight of the cards that you gave. So then I found that it kind of like naturally caused you to think in other ways. Great. So just you trying to use a couple actually prompted you to use more. Yeah. Cool. Great. What do you think? And also, like, I felt like it almost did, like, the hard part for you. It kind of gave you a solution to your task, and then it was just up to you how to implement that solution. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of, like, I feel like almost, like, less creative than coming up with, like, your own idea and, like, kind of having to find a solution for yourself. So you didn't feel like it was hard to be creative, maybe, because it kind of gave you the way to, yeah. to find the solution. That's great. I thought it actually kind of, like, hindered my ideas because it gave, like, two examples of that. And so I just kept thinking about those examples uh -huh. and how I could use that like, same exact example yeah. as well as leveraging them. So I kind of like got stuck. Yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely a temptation. Did you have a comment about that? Yeah, I really actually like the examples. They like kind of sparked a lot of different ideas like, uh -huh. that the front of the card might not have. Right, yeah, I mean, so we've seen people, you know, use both sides and, you know, maybe finding yourself attached to those examples, one of the things I've seen people do is just not look at the examples. For you, you know, I've seen people where the abstract image doesn't actually do it, and so people will line up all their cards where it's just the examples. You know, and so obviously there's not one right way to use them, and you kind of have to figure out what works for you. Other comments? Thoughts? Yeah. At the very beginning, I found myself being like really quickly judgmental of all my ideas. Like I was like, oh, well, that would never work. Nobody would ever want that. And then like as like, there was only like 10 minutes that we had, but like towards the end, I, it was like easier to just like go with it and be like, you can tweak it later. Yeah. That's great. So do you think that using these changed your evaluation? Or what do you think it was about your process that made you kind of let go of that evaluation? This is kind of like dumb, but there were so many cards in front of me that I was like, hey, like, let's just get it all out there and then like work it out later. Like, I don't, That's great. It kind of like because there were so many, it just kind of inspired me to like think more divergent. Great, great. Yeah. I actually called my ideas like without the cards. And then I went back to the cards and then realized which ones they fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Maybe reading the cards initially subconsciously triggered the Probably ideas, subconscious. but I thought of them all like without specifically looking at them. Uh huh. So you let the you read the cards, digested that, and then saw and what then you I could just, come yeah. up with. Cool. Yeah. Well, I think it was the card doesn't help like, add more, more layers of function. Uh huh. Like, So you would take a card and then elaborate on the yeah, concept so like, that you had like, already like, made. Yeah, so like a card is an idea, but not going to be another card. It's like an actual idea to have more components. Great. So you use multiple cards to keep building your idea. Awesome. Yeah. Great, so the titles are what worked for you. Any other comments? Any last comments you want to get out? Yeah. I'm glad that like it is in like elementary. Like like the descriptions are like I like I feel like they get you to like do this, do this, and then do this. Like they actually are like kind of like like real systematic. Yeah, they're systematic and like I feel like the English someone who's well versed in English could like could, like read this and not feel like something talking down to them, you know? Yeah. Like, Um, so one of the things, one of the stories that I actually like to tell, and I know I encouraged this before, but, um, you know, did anybody hit a card and you were like, oh, that card's not going to work for salt and pepper shaker? Did it feel like that? I mean, so, so admittedly, certainly some cards aren't going to work for a particular problem. There are 77 of them. That's probably not going to happen. But one of the things 
that I've seen is when you push yourself to use a card, you can get that really cool solution. There was an engineering class we were working in and they were doing a solar cooker device and two different students had the card twist and you know they certainly didn't know what cards each other had but at the end of the session we had them fill out a, a survey about what cards were most useful and what cards were least useful and one of the students came up with this really cool twisted solar cooking device he said it was his best idea his favorite idea that was the best card this other student wrote twist question mark what would I even twist you know, and so for him, you know, or him or her, that card, you know, was like a throwaway. But this other person who, you know, really pushed to come up with this idea, it was one of the best ideas that I saw in the class. So that's, I tell that story just sort of as encouraging words that even if you hit this place where a card might not feel like the card that fits, sometimes that's maybe where the creativity is. Maybe that's the entrance to something creative. So what we're going to do is move into teams. So what I want you to do is on your envelope, you should have like a team number. And I think the way that Jim passed it out is you should be by your teams. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. So you buy and then like, yeah, I'm yeah. yeah. So what we'd like you to do is with your team, share with your team the concepts that you came up with and what cards you use to come up with those concepts. And then what we'd like you to do is pick a couple of cards that each of you had that maybe you didn't apply yet. You know, maybe you thought uh, just functions for specific users didn't make sense. So put that one out there. And so now as a team, you'll have a collection of some of these cards that you maybe thought weren't very useful. And then as a team, we want you to try to generate a few more ideas. So as a team, make it your goal to generate five more ideas with cards you haven't used before. And certainly, um, you'll be able to look at each other's cards. And amongst your group, you should have 75 of the 77 cards, I think. Questions about what I want you to do? Okay, so get with your teams, share your ideas, pick a couple cards that you're going to push yourselves to work on. short I hope you had a, a good time and I heard a lot of really creative ideas so I congratulate you on that if you could put your cards back in your envelope we'll collect them the concepts you made are yours and I heard some really great ideas so feel free to do what you want with those yeah I've seen a patent over here <laughs>